Hello, and welcome to the final webinar of our Lincoln's Great Words Challenge. I am Cynthia Gertson, Associate Director for Arts Education with Forwards Theatre. I'm pleased to welcome you to the culminating event of our Summer Challenge, inviting the public to learn about Lincoln's Great Words and create a video performance of one of Lincoln's speeches to share with Forwards. After taking a deep dive into six of Lincoln's speeches, Today, we are excited to welcome historians Joanne Freeman and Heather Cox Richardson to consider the importance of oratory in leadership. The discussion will be moderated by a master fellow with the Ford's Theater National Oratory Fellows Program and a fellow history educator, Mr. Gianni Clarkson. It is my great pleasure to introduce Gianni. Gianni joined the National Oratory Fellows Program in 2014 and is a 2019 recipient of Ford's Lincoln Teacher Leader Award. For the past 10 years, he has been a history educator in DC public and chartered public schools. He is also an adjunct professor of education and theater production at Coppin State University and Dillard University. He's very active in social justice and equity work in the DC metro area and a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Welcome, Gianni. Hey, thank you so much, Cynthia. Really appreciate it. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here and to continue the amazing work of Ford's Theater and the oratory program. Um, spend time, of course, talking about the power of words. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce our two guests for today's discussion. Now, Dr. Joanne Freeman is a professor of history and American studies at Yale University, specializing in American politics and political culture. Her interest in political violence and political polarization, dirty, nasty politics, has made her particularly relevant in recent years. Now, Dr. Freeman is the author of numerous books, including The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress, and The Road to the Civil War, which focuses on physically, physical violent clashes in the House and the Senate chambers and how they shaped and sad, basically saved this country. Uh, she also co-hosts the recently concluded popular U.S. history podcast, Backstory, and is a frequent public speaker, commentator, and historical consultant. Uh, Dr. Uh, Heather Cox Richards Richardson is a professor of history at Boston College and the author of numerous books as well uh, about American history and politics, a graduate of Harvard University's program in the history of American civilization a graduate of Harvard University's program and is the author of her most recent book, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. Dr. Richardson writes widely for popular publications and is the author of the daily newsletter about the history behind today's headlines. We just want to welcome you both and thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. So <laughs> we see that so much of our current politics and public disclosure is, is really steeped in uh, a lot of unresolved issues from the past by misrepresenting history, the stories of what we thought things to be true about our country, the representation of what we believe to be the truth versus what is actually the truth. And it's about a leadership and just a language that's intertwined in what is right, what is absolutely wrong. So as we set this tone for this, I'm going to take a little personal privilege because I have recently read both of these books. When can I get both of these <laughs> autographed by you all? I, am I doing it correctly? Product placement. And when can I get them both autographed? When? I'll, just, I'll mail them. I'll mail them to you. It'll be great. Anytime. Be great. Anytime. <laughs> I'll mail them both to you. It'll be great. I love it. All right. So let's go here. So through the Lincoln um, Great Words Challenge that we have here, Ford has spent the past six weeks leading this exploration of, of his work. Now, could you both talk about Lincoln, how his own use of language and speeches was a part of his leadership style? Anyone can kick us off with that. Well, maybe I'll start off by talking a little bit about style and then um, Heather can talk a little bit about how he deployed that. Mm -hmm. um, stylistically, one of the really interesting things about Lincoln is he he, in a sense, he was the right man for the right time, because at the time that he really came into his own, the, the English language was kind of undergoing its own kind of revolution. It was becoming a lot more straightforward. There was a lot of highfalutin rhetoric that was being tossed aside. You didn't have to sprinkle Latin in the middle of what you were saying. And so he really stepped forward at the right moment. And then he, in particular, was such a master at being... Um, straightforward and and plain but dignified and talking about 
broad, sweeping, important ideas in a way that everyone could understand. Mm -hmm. When you look at um, comments, people at the time commenting on his oratory, the word that they always use was peculiar. Right, right. And they don't mean bad, they just mean he sounds different. And, and that difference was a power. Correct, I absolutely believe that. Dr. Richardson? Yeah, I would say about Lincoln that it's really important what Joanne just identified, that he didn't use language that was confined at the time to the Eastern universities like Charles Sumner did. I mean, when Charles Sumner started to give a speech in Congress, people tended to head for the doors simply because they were going to be so irritated by the time he finished because he was so busy spouting Greek and Latin just to prove that he could. Right. Lincoln never did that. But what he did do was reach for language that both spoke to common people from the West where he grew up, but also that, um, that had a wonderful rhythm, an almost religious rhythm to it. And that, um, that brought people along with what he was saying. But he put in that simple language really important universal ideas, but also ideas, ideals and ideas that spoke to people at the time because they talked about the preservation of democracy. So, so often when you hear a Lincoln speech or even read some of the fragments he wrote to himself, it almost sounds like you're in church. And yeah. that was a really important part about people both listening to what he was saying, moving forward with what he was saying, but also internalizing what he was saying and having it lift them up to something greater. He was really a master at it. I remember when I was in, I think it was eighth grade and our, um, our English teacher was talking about great writers and she kept talking about how nobody was a better writer than Abraham Lincoln. He was known as one of the greatest writers in American history and right. the man sitting in front, the boy at the time sitting in front of me, Carl Winslow, I still remember his name, oh. wrote a note and passed it back to me and said, didn't he also have something to do with ending slavery? And I thought, you know, that's probably important to it, not to an English teacher. Right. It's often talked about the, the ability to gain the world but never lose the common touch. And I think that seems to be a very consistent motif when we look at Lincoln's speeches. And I think that's why it's so peculiar, is because it's this ability to be a leader, but not a leader that talks down to everyone. So it's that ability to keep that common touch. And it goes right into uh, next question that at Ford, we have this amazing mantra, which means that says simply that words have power. Now, from a historian's perspective, how did leaders use speech or language at the more granular level to shape this country during the 19th century? What makes Lincoln peculiar compared to his predecessors? Or what is some language that you see that seems to be a common theme that shows up a lot? Joanne, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, about emotion? Because that seems to fit really in here so nicely. Sure. Um, so, you know, one thing that's um, worth thinking about when you think about oratory in this time period is it was a pastime. It was a popular pastime. Right. You have a long distances to hear people speak for three hours, which we really don't do anymore. Right. Um, but, but part of that, you wanted to be entertained. Um, obviously, there are different ways of being entertained, and some had a far more um, formal way of doing that mm -hmm. than Lincoln did. But part of what was also going on was when you were speaking, you wanted to possess the crowd in some way. You wanted to move people in some way. And a lot of what politics is about is inspiring emotion in people, right. inspiring them to want to do something or to not want to do something or to love an idea or to hate an idea. Mm -hmm. And powerful oratory, oratory that really does that, gives the person using that oratory a kind of power. Now, there are admirable ways of doing that and there are less admirable ways of doing that. Right. It's a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying I believe, I'm, I'm saying- Oh I yeah, believe. absolutely. But um, I think it's easy to forget the degree to which uh, inspiring emotions in the public when you are a, a speaker using oratory, that's really deliberate and usually really carefully crafted. And if it's done really well, you don't realize that. Right. If it's done really well, it sounds natural and yet you're caught up in whatever that speaker is trying to get across. Right, I absolutely agree. Dr. Richardson? Well, 
One of the things that Lincoln did that was different than other orators of his time, really dramatically in the late 1850s, was the language that had been uh, dominating at least the democratic side of pol political discussions in the 1850s was a language of us and them. Right. It was the deliberate construction of anger and hatred and racial animosity, and it was an attempt attempt to divide a populace and then get to power by talking, by, by riding on a wave of racism mm -hmm. and, um, and a desire really to guarantee that America was going to be a white man's republic, if you will. So it raised all sorts of negative emotions. So if you think, for example, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you know, Douglas hits again and again and again on, um, on dividing the American population. Right. But what Lincoln does mm -hmm. is he very deliberately uses that same sort of inclusionary language, not to identify a group, an in-group that then hates an out-group, but rather to say, we're all in this together. And if you're not in it together with us, then maybe you better think about what democracy really means to you. And he turns, he does it not only in the language, but also in the way he interacts with his enemies, which is really quite deliberate. I mean, Lincoln was a, 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 an impressive man in many ways, but you never can forget that Lincoln was, first of all, a politician. So he is modeling what he is trying to communicate with words as well. So, for example, when um, when in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, when Douglas hits him again and again and again with really underhanded, um, nasty accusations, Lincoln mm -hmm. keeps coming back sort of with humor and gently and and sort of saying, "Well, you know, you know, that's not really quite the way it is." And that sort of um, that that emotion that he raises that we could all be part of something better or we could go down the Douglas Road and be part of a world of hatred, I think carried through in his language and his manner in a way that really offered a new kind of politics in that particular moment in 1858, 1859, 1860, and then of course going into the Civil War. And you, you know, humor can be such a powerful weapon in and of itself. And, and yes. what, I, what I think about is, um, there was a senator, again, in the 1850s, um, who was from New Hampshire, um, and his particular, and he was an abolitionist, right. and his particular skill was um, saying things so that Southerners would get all riled up in defense of slavery, and they would, you know, red-faced and blustering and yelling about, you know, these people are trying to take over our states. And this fellow from New Hampshire managed to always perfectly make the humorous comment that just punched a hole right, right. in the balloon of pompousness. And the room would begin to laugh. And this red-faced Southerner usually had to just kind of sit down. <laughs> you know, so his, his moment had passed. And, you know, so in that way, again, it's about emotion. But humor, um, if you can own the, the mood in a room, that's also a real power. Yeah. And so I was just saying, the point of almost of making someone feel just kind of dismiss without using rude or, or evil or rude language to do so. And it seems to be that's the tactic that Lincoln uses a lot inside of Douglas is that I'm going to allow you to get riled up and then in turn, I'm going to basically pretend like this didn't even exist, which I think is such a unique uh, technique. It's very, very unique technique. Dr. Richard, I know you, I, I think I cut you off. What are you saying? Only that in the particular in that particular moment where Lincoln was operating, and interestingly enough, I think again in the present moment, humor had a special platform. Mm. And and you know, you, you, I mean, it's a little hard. And I, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but when I think of William Henry Harrison, I don't think of a lot of, of a barrel of laughs, right? Mm. But in the middle of the 19th century, you've got Mark Twain, you've got Artemis Wood, you've got all these people starting to look at politics through that bubble popping. Uh, comedy and Lincoln wrote that and when you think about uh, about humorous politicians or humorous presidents he's pretty close to the top and again you can see that in the present moment his tempers are so high you know all it takes is that little skewering to sort of deflate the mm -hmm. other side and he manages to ride that that rural um, earthy actually a lot of that stuff got got left behind but that earthy humor into disarming the the real tensions of the day and yep. it, it it changed or it affected the way that the american public interacted with him no absolutely, um, absolutely. what popped into my head and it's a little anecdote but i just think it's so revealing um during his presidency uh someone gave a washington official um, a, and a, just a member of the public, a pair of socks 
with the Confederate flag under each foot. Wow. Now, first of all, someone thought to do that and then said, I'm going to give this to the president. And the president enjoyed that immensely, right? That that He thought that was very funny. He offered right. a big thank you for the socks. But not every president would be the kind of person that people would think to give that kind of a gift to and understand that they would understand the, the pointedness of it and, sure. and in a sense, the humor of it. Sure. I, I think about this statement of uh, our first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, says this all, well, said this in this polarizing moment was that when they go low, you go high. And we're seeing this to be this transitioning moment inside of these great debates. And it seems to be, like I said, something that follows Lincoln all the time. Let me go high instead of going low. Let me, in fact, that'll be my transition to you, Dr. Freeman, is this. In the, our 1850s, Congress went a little low a lot of times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your book, In the Field of Blood, you write about how words and violence were intertwined in this 1850s Congress. Now, what are the lessons from that era uh, for today? Well, um, I mean, there are a couple of them. And one of them, I guess, plugs into um, what you said. It's sort of one of the guiding mm -hmm. uh, sayings of your entire project, and that is that words have power. Um, right. What's fascinating is if you look at what members of Congress are saying in those last few years before the Civil War, again and again and again, people stand up in Congress and say to each other, watch your words, mm -hmm. watch your words. If you use the wrong words, this room, there'll be bloodshed. Yeah. And you know, the degree to which they were focused on language specifically intrigued me and, and sometimes even surprised me. There, there's a, there was an anonymous letter from a Southerner written to the Speaker of the House in the late 1850s, who was a Northerner. And the, this anonymous statement said, you tell your people not to throw missiles mm. to us. And by missiles, he meant words. By yeah. missiles, he meant attacking words. So, you know, one of the things that the, my writing and my, you know, Congress in this time period shows is the absolute awareness of the power of words and the way that they can create violence. I mean, anyone who, who uses the word missile and connects that with words is right. downright just stating, you know, that's what it can cause. And in the case of the Congress before the Civil War, what happens is, you know, the Southerners for a long time had been kind of bullying their way into um, really protecting slavery and intimidating Northerners. What changes in the late 1850s is that Northerners begin to fight back. Right. They say, we're not going to be bullied anymore. Mm. We're a different kind of Northerner. Your words aren't going to affect us that way. We're willing to fight you now. So it escalates what's going on in this time period. I think it's, it's so easy to underestimate the power and to say, oh, they're just words. Right. Um, that, that, in a sense, is a statement that doesn't really have a logic behind it. No, I definitely, definitely agree. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us here at Ford's Theater. We are joined by the brilliant Dr. Freeman and Dr. Richardson talking about the importance of oratory and leadership. So I want to pull, no, actually, we'll wait. We'll wait and do this. Um, let me go right here to this question for you, Dr. Richardson. You've written about how the oligarchy during the civil, the post-Civil War used language to undermine democracy and to expand express, uh, westward. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's that's something that I'm, I'm looking at my book right now, looking at highlighted pages, and I don't want to be the nerd that pulls that up, but I'll, I'll let you work from there. <laughs> Well, so let me start with what Joanne just talked about mm -hmm. and the power of words. And, you know, a lot of us older people at least grew up with that saying, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, that's right. exactly wrong in a lot of ways. And I think people understand really, especially in the modern era, the power of words, both through the rise of the Fox News channel, which is very deliberately creating a narrative, but certainly when Newt Gingrich ended up as the, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the 1990s, uh, a pack associated with him was in charge of sort of um, welcoming the the newbies, the newly elected Republicans into the fold, into the into leadership positions, and telling them how to talk about politics. Mm -hmm. And they literally gave them a document saying, when you talk about Democrats, use words like loser and mm -hmm. socialism and traitor mm -hmm. and you know nasty words. And when you talk about Republicans, use words like prosperous and cheerful. And you know, construct the other, construct the enemy through the use of language. Right. But behind the 
that there is a larger thing, and that's the construction of the stories we tell ourselves, both about our own lives, but also about America. And what happened after the Civil War was in the 1860s and then into the 1870s, people who opposed to the inclusion of African American men at the time in the body politic began to realize that if they continued to object on issues of race, they weren't going to get far because under Grant, you get the construction of the Department of Justice and right. the, the KKK acts that, that stop the, the KKK from terrorizing their black neighbors. But they start to talk about the way, about their opposition to uh, black male inclusion in the body politic in a new way. And what they say is that um, they don't want African-American men to be voting, not because they object to their race, which is ridiculous, of course they do, right, right. But, but because um, African-American men coming out of enslavement didn't own property. They didn't, weren't allowed to own property during enslavement and they didn't own property or much property immediately after the Civil War. But at the same time during the Civil War, the Republican Party has invented American national taxation. And after the war, taxes, both at the national level, but also at the state and local level, were higher than they had ever been before, especially in the South. So what people began to say, what white Democrats began to say in the South, is that they objected to black participation in society, not on racial grounds, which was unconstitutional, no but right. rather on the, along the question of money that they did not think it was fair for people who didn't own property to be voting for policies that cost tax dollars, you know, roads and hospitals and schools and things. And that construction of a narrative right there between 1865 and about 1874, that poor people, especially people of color, and in the 20th century, that's going to include women as well, should not participate in the body politic because it means they will vote to redistribute wealth. wealth right. That okay. is, they will um, they will advance socialism or communism has skewed our american politics ever since it's a very speaking of which peculiar kind of construct for a way to run a country that if in fact you put in place policies that that promote the social welfare that that give us schools and roads and hospitals and all the things that most of us want that somehow that is communism or socialism which in fact it isn't of course those are very distinctive schools of uh, or, or political systems these are that's not that kind of political system but that narrative goes into place immediately in the post-war years and anytime it looks like um, there that people of color or women are going to get um, approach equality, the um, that argument comes up again and again, you know, that you can't right. let that happen because you're going to usher in socialism or communism. And, you know, you can see that in the present era. Yeah, you definitely can. It's 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 sadly that there's just so many through lines that we see even today in 2020 politics. That's a little scary. So this is where I'm going to shift into our little bit of our contemporary connection. So let's shift gears for a second and let's talk about our contemporary leaders. So how do you believe that our current contemporary leaders use language to shape local and regional and national identities inside of like policy and politics? Is it a deliberate effort uh, or is it how leaders should speak of a product of local, regional or national standards? Is it a chicken and egg situation? Is it which comes first? What do you believe is the most important or is it all together? Joanne, you wanna take this one on? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, as far as the basic question, which is um, contemporary leaders, what are they doing and is it deliberate? Right. Um, connects back with what I was talking about before about emotion. Yeah, it's really deliberate. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the rhetoric that's being thrown around today is a rhetoric to inspire distrust, right? Distrust of yeah. the distrust of national institutions, hatred of identifying the other and then encouraging people to hate the other. Um, objectifying the other. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rhetoric being used now um, that, you know, under, you know, normal is a tricky word, but under more normal circumstances would not be the norm in ongoing political conversation. But when you get to, when you get to the point that you're so polarized that each side believes that the other is un-American, unacceptable, right. not, as, as Heather put it, not part of an us, that, that they're just by definition, out of the us, that that becomes a moment when you, your rhetoric is just grounded on proving that again and again and again. So right. it re not every political leader is engaged in this rhetoric of hatred, but many are. 
Yeah, I, I noticed that it's a theme that it, the best way to defeat a political uh, opponent is to remove them from the fabric of the American dream. Make them more of a them than us. They don't understand what we are going through. Therefore, they'll never understand you, the common voter. Dr. Rissa, am I right on this or am, I, or am I on left field about this? I think you are right. And one of the things that you've seen in the last four years or so in America, and of course we can go back longer and talk about longer uh, threads as well, but in the past four years, you had a presidential candidate who began by talking about um, how uh, immigrants to America were, were criminals. Right. And that rhetoric has escalated as uh, the president's following has, um, has gotten smaller until now, you know, if you look, for example, at the executive order from June 26th, uh, talking about how the federal government, the federal uh, law enforcement officers for, uh, that are operating under the Department of Justice are forced to fight back in America against what they are calling violent anarchists. Mm. Um, the language that you're seeing is really dramatic on how it reads out of American society virtually anybody who opposes the president. And that's really quite unusual in American history. And, um, and, right. and it's worrisome not only because of the definition of an other, but there has also been for longer than the last four years, an escalating language on the part of people on the right um, to dehumanize their opponents, to talk about them right. in terms of bugs or, um, or, uh, or uh, parts of earth, you know, they flood things. And, you know, it's one of those things that historians pick up and, and people who don't study history are like, oh, you guys are such nerds, who cares that they're talking about you know, these crazy things. <laughs> but we pay attention to those things because they are hallmarks of a society that's going in a very, very dangerous direction. So that language is very worrisome as well. And of course it's used to mobilize a population to support a particular political position. I also think right. it's worth noting that something that Joanne just said when she's talking about re one side reading the other out of um, legitimate participation in American society. I think it's really important, and I also think that Joanne would probably back me up on this, to talk about who's in power. So one of the things you see a lot nowadays is when something happens with the administration, somebody says, well, what about? And you know, my answer to that is always that if those whatabouts get into power, then yeah, I'll be happy to talk about that as well. But you right. cannot put the president of the United States, senators of the United States, governors of the United States, uh, you know, representatives of the United States in the same balancing act that you put, you know, some wacko on the street. The, right. the, the words that come from our leaders really, really matter. They have super, super weight. And it's, it is absolutely imperative to hold them to a much higher standard than you would, you know, your crazy uncle in the attic. Right, because they're, they're representing, well, let me be careful here. There should be a reverence for being in leadership. And I feel that once reverence is lost, then you start to say anything. Um, I'm always afraid of hubris. And hubris is of course known because you know the laws of the land, Therefore, you believe that you're bigger than the laws of the land. And I think that when we start to see that in our leaders, it disenfranchises people from the American dream and the fabrics of what makes our nation great. Um, it's interesting that you said that, Dr. Richardson, because it, you, it, it's, this, this question leads in. We are in this technology age, and we know that how our leaders talk to us is a completely different, right? So how would you say is the impact or the shift in communication through from the telegraph to television, to Twitter, to social media about how our leaders communicate messages to us? What do you believe are the pluses, the minuses, what what are 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 is anything good so to say <laughs> well well so just just for fun here you know we have the great advantage of having historians who cover the whole gamut of american history so maybe right. it'd be fun to start with joanne on this and talk about how technology used to be when i don't know there was like a horse and a and a guy with an envelope <laughs> right joanne <laughs> well precisely you know um we project ourselves back in time and and take a lot of things for granted right mm -hmm. and we don't, it's very hard to put ourselves in the mind of people in the late 18th century or the very early 19th century who, um, if they wanted to reach the public, 
had to try pretty hard, right? They had to potentially maybe get into a newspaper, but the newspapers were about four pages long. So it wasn't as though it was easy to write an op-ed for the newspaper. And then once it came out, typical circulation for a newspaper was like a thousand people. And that was pretty big. And they were read aloud. But the fact of the matter is, it was hard to communicate um, as a politician. I remember once finding um, someone from Massachusetts who uh, the news that was spreading in the press was that he was dead. Mm. What I found was letter after letter with him writing home saying, I'm not dead, <laughs> I'm not dead, because he was having a very hard time proving it. So, you know, the nation wasn't connected by great networks of communication in the way that we take for granted now. Now, something that changed that really, really dramatically was the telegraph. Now, railroads did that by connecting people more quickly. Um, right. and Steam powered printing presses and all kinds of other things helped communication. But the telegraph really changed politics because if you think about it, particularly a democratic politics is fundamentally a conversation mm -hmm. between the people and the people who they've given power to. And any technology that changes the nature of that conversation is going to change politics and potentially change the nation. So the telegraph did that in a big way. The telegraph suddenly, if you stood up in Congress or in Washington and said something inflammatory, in 45 minutes, the entire nation might know about it. Yep. There was no, no wiggle room. And that was not something that they were used to at the time. Um, a really dramatic story that shows them realizing this happens in uh, 1850 uh, when one senator pulls a gun on another senator. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. And, um, you know, people, they, they would call it um, a stampede, actually, what they called it at the time. There was a, a congressional stampede and everyone runs over to the guy with the gun and, and people sit down and they're just going to go back to work because it's not the only time that's happened. But <laughs> I know, which in and of itself is shocking. Someone yeah. stands up and says, I, I feel the need to say at this point that in 45 minutes, the nation is going to be reading that we're slaughtering each other in this room. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about it? Right. And there's no answer, right? The telegraph has totally transformed the power that politicians have over their words. Right. You know, I think Heather can continue on, but the fact of the matter is any technology that quickens or changes or fundamentally alters communication is, is by definition going to challenge mm -hmm. democracy and, and cause a lot of reshifting and re and that's exactly what the people realized during the Civil War and then immediately after it, is that controlling the media, controlling what people think about the world is the key to deciding what America is going to become. So, for example, when you have the the, the establishment of um, things like the Associated Press after, uh, after um, the Civil War, mm -hmm. it's a problem that the people that they hire in the South are all former Confederates because their version of what's happening in the South is of course going to be dramatically different than what African-American journalist George Ruby, for example, in Texas is going to be talking about. So people understand quickly that they need to control the media. They have to control what, what people uh, what people understand about what's happening, which is actually how we get the rise at the turn of the next century of a kind of uh, nonpartisan journalism, mm -hmm. because there was a sense that the extraordinary splits of the late 19th century were in large part because of the partisan media. And it was important that people had access to what was really happening, to facts without editorial spin. And it's from that when we get the rise of American radio that we get the concept of the fairness doctrine, the idea that the media should fairly present both sides of an issue and try to be as nonpartisan as it possibly could be. Mm -hmm. Of course, that system broke down in, uh, in a couple of times. It broke down in the 1950s when um, Joe McCarthy, figured, Senator Joe McCarthy of Wisconsin figured out that because the media was simply reporting what he did, he could lie with impunity and there was nobody to stop him. Right. Um, but then we get the destruction of the fairness doctrine in 1987 on under, the, the, under Ronald Reagan, which gave rise to what we have now, the, the rise of talk media and eventually the Fox News Channel, which again is not a news channel, that's its name. It is explicitly uh, for entertainment purposes only in its terms of service. Mm. And from this we get um, the, the, the rise of Twitter and Facebook. And what's really interesting to me about those is that uh, both of them, but especially Facebook, is of course a commercial product. 
And right. if you understand advertising, you understand that what happens on, with advertising in any kind of a commercial setting, it actually began with radio and then moved into TV um, with Frank Stanton in the 1950s um, when he took over one of the major networks. They're, what they're selling is not a product to the person watching TV or using Facebook. What they are selling is the packaging of the people who use that product. Right. And once you have crossed that barrier, it becomes much easier to package voters and sell them to a political, one political team or the other. Other, so right. What you, what you see now in Facebook, and especially Facebook, but also Twitter, is that packaging of American voters to one side or another. And it's something that we really need to understand and probably put legislation around because we understand now the power of words and the power of being able to sway a voter, not by an ad that says, you know, vote for Donald Duck, but rather an ad that says, did you notice the ducks are starting to take over your local pond? Right. And that sort of thing is, we understand now uh, through uh, the psychology of advertising, just how powerful spoon-fed stories like that can be in swaying an election. No, I absolutely agree. It's, and with my scholars, we, um, whenever there is a controversial issue or we're doing a current affair issue, I tell them, stop looking at the website that makes you comfortable or that's going to tell you how you should feel about something. So I've been really big on pushing a website which is called All Sides, which is about looking at all points of view of the story. And now that you have this information, now tell me how you feel. Because I don't want you to be, giving, I don't want to receive microwaved opinions. Something that you read in basically two minutes or less, and now all of a sudden that's your opinion because it makes you feel good. Push against those things and, and lean into the uncomfortableness to find out what really is the heart of an issue. I think that's where um, American politics and great social studies teacher teaching begins and ends. And I feel like a lot of times that gets lost. Let me ask you all this. Um, what else? And we have these really great books. Once again, this four theater oratory, I'm sorry, four theater, four theaters, importance of oratory and leadership. We're with Dr. Freeman, of course, Dr. Richardson, and we're having a great conversation here. What else would you, and I'm asking you all this, what else would you both want the American public to know about how language is used by leaders? If, if you could give us the cheat code when they're saying they're saying that, and, I'm, and I once again, or what are some things that you've noticed in this contemporary world compared from the, the two, uh, from the Civil War era to now? What would you say? I guess that's a, that's a right fair frame of that question. The first thing that I would say about the modern era is take a breath, mm. which I think builds exactly on what you said. When people want you to make a decision instantly, mm. um, the chances are pretty good you're going to make a bad decision. So when right. you see a breaking story and your instant reaction is to uh, to that it fits into your narrative, take a breath because it's that story is still going to be there tomorrow. And if in fact that is what's going on, um, you'll be able to talk about it then. But there's an awful lot of stuff that breaks on Twitter or on Facebook, for example, that people instantly try to shoehorn into their narrative. And right. it's not the case. And then, you know, the next day when it's corrected, that doesn't travel nearly as quickly. So, so wait, um, you know, wait a day or so. And my great example of that was when, in fact, um, there was a, um, uh, the, the killing of Soleimani um, a few months ago. I can't remember now when when it was. There was also, if you remember, uh, a plane shot down, and what people said at the time was uh, possibly a nuclear test. And you know, at the time, if people were just crazy, oh my, look, you know, look what Iran's doing. It's testing, you know, it's testing nukes again. And um, I was actually very fortunate when that happened. I was as freaked out as everybody else. But I wrote to a geoscience person and said, was that a nuclear test? And he said, wow. absolutely not. And I said, well, how do you know? And he said, because the nuclear tests, we see them all the time and they have really distinctive signatures. Well, that's one of those things that faded out of the news, but for a long time it went, it, you know, for about 12 hours, people were like, that's it, we're on the verge of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. So right. take a breath is the first one. And the second one is if somebody is trying to make you angry at uh, a specific person, you know, as opposed to inequality or, um, uh, a systemic situation, if they are trying to say your neighbor or these people are a problem, 
be suspicious because again, there's plenty of time if it turns out that in fact, you know, the there is a specific person to be unhappy with, there's plenty of time to get there. But usually that kind of personal animosity is going nowhere good. Nice. Nice. Um, I would I would add two things. Um, one of them, I guess I would say, is a, a kind of riff on what Heather just said, but I think it needs to be said, which is political oratory isn't neutral. Mm. It, meant to have a message. And in the same way that Heather just said, you have to take a breath. You have to pause to think about what that person is actually trying to tell you as opposed to what the words say. You have to think about the motive behind what's being said. And I think it's easy if you don't take that breath that, that Heather mentioned to get swept up in what's being said and then to sort of take it on, particularly it, as both of you have been saying, if, if it fits into your silo of information, then it's true. The second thing that I would say is, um, you know, in a way that the internet um, and other things that have sped up the way that language is happening also can work to our benefit. And so I would say if something is said uh, and whether you see something on social media and you assume it's true and don't know, or if someone says something in a speech and you're not sure about it, you can do the work online of digging around. And Heather just gave a wonderful example of that in right. which you contacted someone who knew and said, is this true? And that person said, no. Now the trick of course then is in communicating that, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is you can answer, ask and answer a lot of questions if you, as you suggested before, do research with an open mind. Is this true or is this not true? Don't head into um, places that, you know, again, are obviously going to be sending you a message, but see if you can find an authority some kind of an authority right. information that will back up whatever is being said or won't. So, you know, it's, it kind of puts a lot of um, stress on our shoulders to think like someone says something and now I must search. But if the oratory is important and if it, if it's going to move you in a way that's significant, it's important to know what to believe. Right. And we're in a moment where truth is um, masked or discarded or, um, sort of steamrollered over. I mean, truth is not apparent right now. And that just makes wow. it harder and more important for us to do due diligence in trying to figure out reality versus words. It's, it's funny that you said reality versus words. I, I tell my students this, that if someone says something and your response is, I can't believe that, then research <laughs> it just to make sure. The right. second thing that I'm big on is that because we're in this hot take society when something happens we have to immediately go our tw our twitter thumbs go to work and we have to reveal this really hot take i always say make sure that today's me is never mad at yesterday's me about <laughs> something that you think. very nice because you don't want to wake up and go oh no yesterday me what have you got us into <laughs> what have you done you know just because as dr richardson just said you failed to take a breath and really understand some things well, thank you guys. So we have, so if you are watching this, thank you all so much for joining us. At this time, we're gonna have a couple questions and answers. So if you want to put your questions inside the chat room, our production will put that up. And of course, I will get those questions to Dr. Freeman and Dr. Richardson, if you don't mind. So let's see if we have any questions that are up and we'll wait for them to be pulled up here. All right, here we go. So here's our first question, who in current politics other than John Lewis, who's recently passed away, has the potential to or it in an inclusionary uh, way. Why isn't this something that politicians study? It's a great question, by the way. Great question. Well, if I can go into it and start, go into it starting backward, I think the reason that people don't do it nowadays is because beginning in about 1960, um, political scientists began to argue that there was no point in talking about large narratives because American voters basically agreed on things. So the way you were able to nail together a winning coalition was simply to do that, to give little pieces to different groups in your constituency and convince them to back you. And as a result, you tended to lose those narratives, those, those things that tied people to any kind of a principle. And so what we ended up with was the few politicians who were doing that were ones who tended not to represent a large portion of the American population. They tended to be trying to, to gin up their own, uh, their own angry coalition. 
But you are seeing now, really dramatically, I think, a change in American political rhetoric. And I saw it really notably mm. in the House managers uh, launching of their impeachment against President Donald Trump, when you had not simply Adam Sch Schiff, but also Val Demings, for example, and all of the people who were managing impeachment, talking in really you know, lofty terms about what it meant to be an American and why it was important to uphold American values and to defend democracy. They reminded me a lot of Barbara Jordan during Watergate, to be honest. So you see that, I think, increasingly. And you've seen it in people like William Barber, the Reverend William Barber, who's talking that way, obviously John Lewis. But again, there seems to be now people, or there seem to be now people who are once again looking for inclusionary language and inclusionary language that talks about principle. And that is a change, a, a shift, I think, in our political system, but it's a shift that also reflects a different approach to getting people to show up at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. And I think related to that, um, inclusive language that's talking about bigger ideas and inclusive language that's talking about the political process. The fact that we have, you know, the Constitution is a shared political process that matters and that things that we take for granted, we shouldn't take for granted, that they matter, how we engage with the matters. You know, right. there's a question, I mean, in a sense, it's it's very similar. If you're talking about big ideas in democracy, you're also talking about how democracy works. And that's something that, you know, it, in one way or another, I suppose people can sort of shift things to be partisan. But the fact of the matter is, if you're talking about the fact that voting rights are important, right. um, talking about the fact that representation matters in our government, those are pretty much factual statements. Right, right. Now is a moment when they're important to talk about process in a way that maybe felt obvious before. And I think that's related to, to what Heather just said. No, I absolutely agree. So if, and I just wanted to put this out here. If you are, thank you again uh, for joining us. For those that are watching this via live stream, if you are interested in more about the Lincoln's Great Works Challenge, uh, there are resources that you can further your study on Lincoln's oratorical style. So that's something that you can look into as well. See if we have some other questions from our chat room that can be pulled up for. So here we go. How can informed, gifted oratories do battle with the flashbang of Twitter and social media? How can we bring the flash and quickness of this social media back, back down to two podiums and two microphones or no microphones? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'll first give, a, in a sense, an obvious answer, but it's a writerly answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, if you're trying to have an impact in a direct kind of a way, I don't know if you can directly compete with the flashbang, which is a great right. way of writing. But <laughs> I just love that, that phrase. But um, yeah, as a writer, when you write short, punchy sentences, um, that has an impact. That's clear. It's quotable. So, you know, if, if you are going on and on and, and explaining things in a very intelligent kind of a way, that it's going to be hard for people to pull things from. If you say things that are, that are catchy and brief, but truthful and sincere. So in other words, if you find, well, okay, this brings us back to Lincoln. Right. If you find a way to be direct and straightforward and say what you mean, and Lincoln obviously worked very carefully at what seemed like natural, clear statements. Right. One way to at least get through the fog of words that we live in. So in addition to the flashbang, I think there's a fog, right? There's there's right. a lot of words floating around and it can be very hard to see through them and come away with, with meaning. Mm -hmm. I also think people are increasingly eager for fact-based discourse. You know, it's been it's been a hallmark on the part of the the, pe the the movement conservatives who took over the Republican Party to move politics based on image rather than reality. And you saw this really dramatically during the George W. Bush administration when a member of that administration said to Ron Suskind, who was then reporting for the Wall Street Journal, that people like Suskind, a reporter, lived in what this member of the administration called the reality-based community. But he said, people in the administration no longer lived in the reality-based community because, as he said, we're an empire now and we make our own reality. And we've really gone into a politics where so much was based on image, on 
being part of your team and, and adhering to the narrative that your team told. And right now we're seeing that that narrative is falling apart, you know, especially with right. the coronavirus. People are recognizing that you can say all you want that it's under control, but it's really not. You know, the mobile morgue suggests it's really not. And so people, I think, are starved for something other than the, the uh, candy floss, if you will, of social media and Twitter and looking for things you can actually get some nutrition from. And those, again, I think it's really important that they be presented carefully and that they be presented in a, in a readable or a watchable fashion. But I, there used to be more resistance to that, I think, when you could have the comfortable narrative. And now that comfortable narrative appears to be really quite dangerous and people are hungry again for something that gives a little bit more sustenance. At least that's been my impression. You know, I don't know what Joanne would say, but you know, 20 years ago, nobody wanted to hear what historians had to say because everything was about what was happening on Wall Street or in Hollywood. Wow, yeah. And, and now you, the opposite is true. No, yeah. it's very true. And and again, it, it does have to do with the hunger for facts. We're living in a moment um, where there's a lot of unprecedented things ha happening on an almost daily basis. And so suddenly people are looking to the past Right, looking to historians to say, okay, has this ever happened before? Right. If it has happened before, what does it mean? And suddenly, in a very direct and very political way, historians are part of this conversation in a way that I haven't seen in, in the time I've been a historian. Um, you know, as, as impeachment was going on, I kept, I, I spoke a lot in public and on television about the simple fact that impeachment was in the Constitution and it wasn't something to be avoided. It was something that was to be deployed when necessary, you know, and I talked about the Constitutional Convention and the creation of it and what people thought the president should be. It's very, speaking as an early American historian, it's not so common for me to be topical in quite that way. But we're at <laughs> precedent matters. Um, yeah. and, and if precedent matters, historians have a real value. I, I think we find ourselves in a world where people are hungry uh, for facts. We've been lacking a lot of nutritional facts in what we believe to be true. And I think it's the job of the historian to feed the American public or feed everyone these audible treats that say, this is the truth. We know what you may believe, but this is the truth. And operating in truth, I think, is what gears and steers uh, our nation to the next great set of leaders, the next great set of policies, to making sure that everyone is a part of the fabrics of America, no one feels disenfranchised by the things that happens because so so long history has been used as a tool to disenfranchise people. And I think that now we have to, we're now in a world where people say, I don't want this to happen anymore, so what do I do? I think we have time for one more question. Let's see if we have time for one more question. Uh, and what pops up, here we go. Why is oratory education critical for young people today? I love this question for so many reasons, but uh, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Richardson, your, your call. <laughs> I mean, I, I would, my first thought about that has to do with actually um, the way I teach. You know, when I, I, I use, um, I have one class where I use only um, primary documents from the 18th yes. century. And I tell my students to, we take them apart, right? We, we look at, we think about, how they're put together. We talk about, um, in a way, very similar to what you were saying, uh, Johnny, at the outset. You know, what are they, what makes sense? Look things up, figure it out. Take right. It. I think it's so important now for our young people to um, understand the, the importance and know how to take apart things that are said. And whether that's true being spoken or whether that's true on paper, they really have to pause and think and, and come up with what actually feels as though it has some grounding in reality. Right. I think oratorical education helps you do that. Also, it does a significant thing in this moment, which again, in a sense sounds so obvious, but isn't. It enables them to step forward in a climate that, you know, flashbang was good, but I'm gonna stick with fog. Um, there's <laughs> a lot circulating around right now. And knowing how, knowing how to write clearly and knowing how to, speak clearly to make your thoughts known in a powerful and impactful kind of a way. Right. That, that's not only personally important, but that is 
can have greater importance depending on who you're speaking to. So those, in a way, that, that's a civic skill in addition to a personal skill. Right. And that is, Joanne hit both of the points that I would have in the exact same order I would have. So the only thing I have to add is one of the things that you see throughout American history is the deployment of American principles to defend one kind of a position or another. And it's really important for people to be able to unpack, for example, how two different people can use the same of founding documents either to defend human enslavement or to oppose human enslavement. And to go back to Lincoln and the Lincoln-Douglas debates, one of the things that's interesting there is in that case, both Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, who was a senator from Illinois at the time, were using the concepts of American democracy, mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution to defend their positions. And their positions, of course, were 180 degrees, uh, you know, opposed. The mm -hmm. idea that that you know uh, Douglas is standing firm on the idea that individuals on the ground should be able to determine democracy, and Lincoln was using a, a, a different set of arguments about what it meant to be in a democracy, and. Um, I think unless you understand that, you look at modern day oratory and you say, yeah, yeah, I'm for, you know, fill in the blank. I'm for law and order. I'm for uh, yeah. equal rights. I'm for, um, you know, fill it in. But you, you need to understand how people are deploying those things and how they are in many ways using your best instincts to try and get you to carry water for something that you might not actually agree with. And right. understanding how words matter I think is um, is key to that. I, I would also say one of the things that is really important, especially for students to understand, but all of us, is that one of the things about oratory is it's really important to remember to watch what people do, not what they say. Very well so said. What people say is a very good way to motivate others to do things, but it's worth looking to see if they're walking the walk as well, because anybody can tell you anything, but that doesn't mean it's actually real. And that business always of looking at what people are doing, not what they're saying, I think is key to understanding just what the world really looks like and what right. your own role is in it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, in the live stream of this. We greatly appreciate your questions during this time. This is, of course, an amazing book. This is, of course, Dr. Freeman's book. Please pick this up. It's a great book. This, of course, is Dr. Richardson's book. They promised me, they put in the chat, that they will be autographing my book. Thank you all so much. Absolutely. I'm very pleased to We so appreciate Dr. Richardson and Dr. Freeman for sharing this time and our incredible insight with us now for our audience please remember to create and share with forge your video of the lincoln speech for the lincoln's great word challenge now we are accepting submissions all the way to july 31st you will find information about sharing your video on forge website which is of course www.forge.org once again www.forge.org and we hope everyone will join us for the next forge theater cabinet conversation which happens on thursday july 30th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, during this live stream event, we will have a great discussion with Eugene Robinson, Mitch, uh, Mitch Landrew, and historian Kev Kevin Levin about the Confederate Monument. This event will be live streamed on Ford's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, on the Ford's webpage as well. Now, for more information about all of Ford's programming, please visit Ford's.org, all right? Once again, thank you all both. Thank you both for sharing this time with us. And thank you all so much for understanding the value of words and sharing your value with us. We really appreciate you both. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Have a great evening or great afternoon. <laughs>